To begin, we gotta define what a database is and an instance is. When I first started teaching this type of class years ago, this was one of the most interesting items is, is how a SQL DBA and an Oracle DBA can actually kind of see these two items differently. And so I want us to be able to come together and define what a database and an instance is in module one. So what we'll do is, as I said, we'll define this one. We'll talk a little bit about the implementation of how a database and instance is within Microsoft and Oracle. We'll have to discuss the client interaction. How do we actually communicate with the database and get information out of a question that we ask to it? And just very quickly, we're going to talk about some key database and instance limitations that SQL Server from Microsoft as well as Oracle's 10G database provide. So there's a lot of definitions for databases. And I think what we can look at is this one key item is that a database itself is a collection of information that is stored in a set of files that can be transferred from some device to another device to be able to be used again. And these may consist of flat files, it can consist of relational database files, it can consist of several other types of B-Treve type environments that we've seen in the past with other databases. But the key thing is that the database is the files. It is what is being stored. Now, the instance itself is where we run the database files. So as we see in this diagram, we see that the client is wanting to go to the other end and communicate with the database. Well, to get there, we have to first communicate across the network, something usually a TCP IP environment, and then within the machine itself, we need to be able to have CPUs, processes, threads, and of course, memory. Memory is a very, very important part. And I like to take this back to being able to manage those files to if you've ever done any development. As a developer, you tend to find out in your, one of your first classes, you write an application. You write it to a flat file. The flat file then has to be opened, and then you add some information to that file. You append it. Then you have to close the file. Now, for you, if you're anything like me, the first couple of times I did this, I accidentally forgot to close the file before I opened it again. And therefore, when I would try to open the file, it would be locked because I couldn't go in there and append anything to it. Well, in essence, this is what database theorists have been doing for a long time, is being able to take the environment, the instance, to help manage the files themselves. So let's talk a little bit specifically about how Oracle and Microsoft look at their instances. Let's begin with a very common one of Oracle 10G. When you install Oracle 10G on a box of any type or a host machine, what you will typically do is you will do an installation, the My Home, and you'll have the opportunity to use that binary file for several different instances. Now each instance can have one and only one database in it. I understand that a single database can span or go across multiple instances, but it is just one database that a single instance can manage. Now within the database, we start looking at how we start to break up our data and how we tend to categorize it. And we look at that with the schema. A schema is a collection of like objects. Now in the Oracle environment, we tend to be able to see this being broken up with applications or by users themselves. And within these applications or users, we tend to have several different objects within that schema. Tables, store procedures, several other topics that will help us be able to manage data. Most of the time this relates back to, even if it's a view, back to a table, a two-dimensional structure, a set of rows and a set of columns. We know that from database theory for a long time now. Within an Oracle database, we can have a number of schemas. We can have many schemas, as a matter of fact. And within each of those, we can have several different objects. And of course, we can have multiple instances. So this gives us a lot of flexibility to be able to take applications or lines of business and be able to associate them on a host machine. To be able to understand how SQL Server works for Microsoft, we need to step back just a moment. 
Let's go back to SQL Server 2000, which was a major rewrite for Microsoft in that they brought it up to really play well within an environment, the enterprise. And of course, 2005, we'll talk about in a moment, and we'll talk about 2008. 2000, when we created a database within a SQL Server machine, we would first install an instance, and that instance would be its own binary set of files. And each instance then could have multiple databases. And when I used to be able to talk to Oracle professionals in the past, I would say, think of the database as you would the schema. The database was set toward a line of business or a specific set of users or to an application. And within that application, we could have numbers of objects, including tables, store procedures, and views. And then we'd have multiple other databases inside that single instance. This is unlike Oracle, where you have one database per instance. But like Oracle, you have a number of schemas on an instance. We had a number of databases. With SQL Server 2008, and even beginning with 2005, what we saw was the capability of having a schema, a true schema that you would have seen in an Oracle environment. The difference here is that we can kind of take the best of both worlds. On the host machine, we can install a number of instances, and we'll talk about those limitations later if there are any. We'll also be able to talk about the number of databases, but we can have several of those in a single instance still. Now within a database, we can have multiple schemas. And those schemas can be associated with a specific application or a user or other like common items of tables, store procedures, etc. Now what I find interesting is, is when I explain this in an Oracle environment, they're like, great, I've worked with SQL Server, I didn't like having multiple databases, great. Microsoft gives me the capability now of taking a database and I can just have one database on an instance with a number of schemas. Good news, you can. But as strange as it might sound to you, having multiple databases on a box, it sounds as strange to a SQL Server professional who's really been doing SQL only to be able to sit there and say, why would I want to do multiple schemas now in 2005 or 2008? I'll just have multiple databases. What you know is usually how you do items. And I think what we're going to find in time, both Oracle professionals and SQL Server professionals, rather than taking one edge of the pendulum, are going to find something in the middle, something that works well for them. They'll have more databases and fewer schemas, or vice versa, more schemas and fewer databases. You've got the opportunity to do this with SQL Server in your applications. So let's talk a little bit about how instances are used and how they are managed within a SQL Server environment. We're going to walk through several demonstrations and have a capability of helping you understand where to look for information and how to manage it. Okay, so you've had the opportunity to use the command line. You've been able to use a couple of additional tools, the configuration manager, and to be able to manage SQL Server and look at where items are installed and where they are registered within the Windows environment. I think it's important to state right here is that, again, SQL Server is working on the Windows environment. And this is where we'll keep our focus. There's not a lot of reason to have a database full of information if there's no way for a client to ask questions to it. So to be able to do this, we have to be able to interact between the client and the database server itself, whether it's Oracle or SQL Server. From the Oracle environment, we have to have the Oracle Net, which is a subset of the Oracle Network services installed on both machines. The client has to have it either from the Oracle installation files or from the application. Either way works as long as it's there. And it's able to communicate at that point through the application layer and then be able to communicate through the protocol of choice, which is typically TCP IP. On the Oracle server, from the Oracle Net services that have been installed there, there's a specific Oracle listener that is listening to a port to be able to gather information from the client. This specific port is allocated and designed through the listener.ora file set up during installation or adapted by the administrator later on. 
Through this, it is able to take the information through this proprietary network and communicate the question to the database files themselves, which then can return a response to the database and transmit through those same protocols and layers back to the client. SQL Server does something very, very similar. In SQL Server, the client has to communicate typically through the SQL Server Native Access Client, or the SNAC. The SNAC is a low-level proprietary protocol that allows the client to be able to communicate with the SQL Server database. If necessary, the application has to communicate through ODBC or OLADB or even other DB libraries. This is feasible and possible with the network environment. If we use a TCP IP environment as our first example, we'll talk about some others, the SQL Server environment in itself is listening to a port. It has a single thread listening for the port to gather the requests that are coming in to be simplified into a special language that SQL Server uses. The SNAC itself back on the client breaks up the request into what is referred to as tabular data strings. And this protocol then is communicated back to the SQL Server database and the changes are made. Back so that it can be read and used to get information out of the file, have a response that is sent back to the client. Now, other than just TCP IP, there are other protocols that work. The simplest one is referred to as shared memory. Shared memory works only on the box that SQL Server has installed itself. It's a local transport call instead of being a remote transport call. It allows you as an administrator to work on that box before ever allowing the outside world to have access to it. There's also the name pipes, which gives you the capability to be able to communicate with SQL Server using names instead of just the TCP IP address. Oracle provides the same capability by using the TNS names.ora file to be able to give an alias instead of having to know the address to the actual Oracle box itself. Another one is being able to communicate with large storage area networks. And we use the VIA protocol that allows us to be able to communicate directly to those data storage environments. It allows for better processing, better speed. Another approach is being able to use something that's referred to as the dedicated uh, administrator client connection. And the DAC allows us to be able to have a special thread that allows you as the administrator to get into the box when other ways are not possible. It's a dedicated thread just for you. So let's go ahead and take a quick look at how SQL Server allows us to look at the different network protocols and to be able to define those settings that a client can use. As you can see, it's pretty simple with the tools that SQL Server provides to us. Finally, let's talk a little bit about database capacities. This particular slide here is really just dedicated to say both environments can deal with a large amount of data. They do it in similar ways, though slightly different. In an Oracle, you have the capability of having a file block size anywhere from 2 to 16 kilobytes possibly four, possibly eight in the middle. Now I know on the Unix side, you're probably thinking, yeah, I can also go to 32 KB. On the Windows side, Oracle only goes to 16 kilobytes. SQL Server always does eight kilobytes. That's what we refer to as a page, or as Oracle would refer to it as a block size. We'll talk about why only eight KB in an upcoming module. The maximum file size. Oracle allows you to have 64 gigabytes in a single file. How many of you are using that today? Probably not a lot. SQL Server provides the capability of going even to 16 terabyte. Can't you wait, look forward to backing up that file? Well, just because you would have one file that big doesn't mean that you should. Typically, they're always much smaller. Now, Oracle and SQL Server provide a certain limitation in the number of files that you can have per database. Oracle provides 65,000, SQL Server only does 32,000. Should be plenty in most environments. Today, 10G in Oracle allows you a four petabyte file. Maximum database size, I should say. Now, that seems like a lot. 
but tomorrow it may not be that big. And I'm sure Oracle will increase their size at that time. SQL Server is already set up to be able to do 524 petabytes and has been for a couple of instances now. Now there are no control files on the SQL side, so we're not really going to discuss how those work. We'll look at some other options dealing with dictionaries and all later. Now instances, very important part. We talked about this at the beginning of this module in that you can have multiple instances on an Oracle database. It's limited only by the resources of the host itself. Hard drive space, memory, as well as CPU. In a SQL environment, we can have up to 50 instances on the standard and the enterprise editions. Now, if this makes it sound like, hmm, only 50 databases, then you're still thinking of the way that Oracle has one database per instance. Remember, SQL Server can have a very, very large number of databases in a single instance. So 50 is not necessarily a concern in that you can have multiple solutions and multiple applications being addressed by a single box. Now given, in either case, to have up to 50 instances or 50 databases on a single host system, it's got to be a pretty powerful box for whatever environment you're working in. Other versions of SQL Server, the work group and below, are 16 or less in their number of instances. What about the maximum number of extents that can exist? Well, an extent is very different in SQL Server from Oracle. We'll talk about how they differ a little bit in a moment, but in Oracle, you can go all, go the, all the way up to four gigabytes. In SQL Server, it's limited to 64 KB, and there's some good reasons for that, and we'll talk about them in the next module when we refer to how it works with the file system provided by Windows. What about the table spaces? You can have up to 65,000 table spaces. Pretty much one file per table space would give you that opportunity. In SQL Server, same situation, 32,000 file groups. Rather than being called table spaces, we call them file groups are available within each system. Now the maximum log size, a very, very important part of both databases' environments, has some differences. Oracle provides one up to 64 gigabytes. Hopefully none of you are really working with any 64 gigabyte log files. And just because SQL Server provides the capability of two terabytes doesn't mean that you'll probably use that in the SQL world either. But the capability is there. Hence, both environments are allowing enterprise solutions to be easily accessible and managed for very large applications through both database systems. So let's look at the review here for Module 1. We've talked about what is a database. A database is a set of files that gives us the capability of storing data that can be moved between different systems. Then we discussed how an instance is the process of managing those database files and working with them within the context of the host system itself. We discussed how to communicate. What are the network protocols? What allows a client to ask a question and get a response back from a database? And finally, we discussed some of the key capacities or limitations, if you wish, of the database environments working on the Windows operating system. That concludes Module 1.